We have uh, had a question with regard to the subject of circumcision and uncircumcision. And so the title of our study will be The Gospel of the Uncircumcision. Now, first of all, just let me say uh, that probably, as I've said this before, as I've touched on these particular subjects, uh, that sometimes it's difficult because, of course, you are explaining uh, uh, matters that are delicate. This is a mixed company. Uh, you're talking about the male sex organ and so forth. And uh, seems that um, there is a, actually a focus with regard to this subject in the Word of God, especially if you are a dispensationalist and you talk about the gospel of the uncircumcision and the gospel of the circumcision. Uh, I'd been a Christian many years, and I had never heard anybody use these terms until I became an out-and-out -out, uh, dispensationalist and understood what these terms really meant. Now, lest you think they are insignificant, I would just like to tell you that you are saved by the gospel of the uncircumcision. That's how you are saved. It's part and parcel of the truth that you must believe in this dispensation before you could ever trust the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how important it is. And yet, uh, Christianity today, I would guess 99% of people uh, who attend churches who call themselves believers won't have a clue as what the gospel of the uncircumcision is. And yet, if they don't understand it, uh, they're going to be rather confused and fuzzy mentally uh, about their own salvation. So we're going to take quite a bit of time and delve into this. Uh, secondly, uh, we are going to uh, delve into it in an explanation of your pastor. Uh, and I do this, I, I never try to make an issue of myself, okay? But I think that I should make an issue of myself because I am a dispensationalist um, of which the breed is dying. I know I'm getting older, but uh, you, they call those uh, uh, people who get older and can't change their ways and can't change their doctrines as dinosaurs, which eventually become extinct. Well, I full well realize that dispensationally, I am a dinosaur because I'm different than almost every other dispensationalist out there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain why. Um, and I think the differences are good. In fact, I think the differences are essential. Number one, I am not an Acts 2 dispensationalist. The church, which is the body of Christ, did not start on the, on the day of Pentecost. Now, there goes the greater portion of Christianity. Uh, people call themselves Christians and start the church on that day. However, I am not an Acts 13 dispensationalist. Now, what does that mean? Uh, there is a man by the name of Charles Baker. He is now with the Lord, a great theologian and a great dispensationalist, a man to whom we owe much. But he believed that the church, and this is the greater number of the mid-Acts dispensationalists today who graduate from Grace Bible College, they follow the thinking of this man and believe that the church started in Acts chapter 13. Or as the nebulous doctrinal statement of the Grace Gospel Fellowship says, it started with the Apostle Paul sometime before he wrote his first epistle. I was, yo, yo, yo. That's real definite, huh? I mean, we, we can really stand on that. We really know uh, where it's, so well, we know where it ends. Uh, yeah, we're with the rapture, but we just don't know where it begins. It's a mystery, nonsense. Paul wrote his first epistle in 54 A.D. He was saved in 34 A.D. That's 20 years. Do you mean to tell me that he operated under this without knowing when in the world the body of Christ started and the dispensation of grace? That is sheer idiocy. But it's just as much idiocy to start it in Acts 13. That's 44 A.D. That's 10 years after he was saved. Yeah, but he went out on his first missionary. Yep, that's true. But didn't he have to get the message to go to the Gentiles before? He went out on a missionary uh, endeavor? Absolutely. That again, to me, is idiocy. Where did the church begin? With the first appearing of Jesus Christ to a man according to mystery. Where was that? Acts chapter 9. 
And if you do not start the church there, and I, I won't mind telling you or any other dispensationalist, if you do not start the church there, you are a heretic. That's exactly where it started. And the parameters of grace are between the first glorious appearing according to, uh, to mystery and the last glorious appearing according to mystery. Ah, uh, yes, but we're going to make some further distinctions. Now, now uh, we have had, and, and I encourage and, and uh, recommend myself, the reading of, of the various things that uh, we have out. But I want you to understand something else. Not all dispensationalists are the same. For example, in the early writings and the early ministry of, of uh, our brother Stan, a man whose Bible I am not worthy to carry. Now, you understand that. I would never... Uh, elevate myself to the level of a, of a Cornelius stand. We owe him much. However, he makes the statement that Paul was saved under the old system and gradually emerged or was assumed into the body of Christ in, in the new system. And I want to tell you that the Apostle Paul was not saved under the dispensation of law. He was saved under grace and emerged from the practices of law. However, I am not like those who say that the Apostle Paul uh, got, saw Jesus Christ here but did not know about baptism and or circumcision until far later. When did Paul receive his message regarding circumcision and baptism? You know where he did? Right from the start. He understood it. And I'll show you, I'll show you why. And it's going to take a while. You're going to have to stay with it. You're going to have to think. But the Apostle Paul received his message to go to the Gentiles. Guess what? When you go to the Gentiles, apart from Israel, apart from Jerusalem, and apart from the temple, what things uh, do you no longer need as far as outward expressions are concerned? Circumcision, baptism, keeping of the law, going back to Jerusalem, and so forth. And when Jesus Christ told him in Acts 9 in the Shekinah glory cloud, I send you to the Gentiles, that absolutely eliminated circumcision and baptism and the rest of the Jewish rituals uh, because they're no longer needed. Israel fell in Acts chapter 7, and God is beginning to set them aside. After Israel's fall, a brand new dispensation was started. And you can't send people to the Gentiles without understanding a couple of things. What about circumcision? What about baptism? And uh, uh, we had, uh, we've got a, a young lady with us who has just been recently saved. And, and uh, someone near and dear to her said, well, at least, at least they haven't dunked you yet. And, uh, and uh, that's absolutely true. You will never get dunked in this church uh, unless someone steals a donut from you that you dunked in coffee. And, then, and you might, you know, but uh, you'll never get water baptized in this church. However, spiritually, you have been baptized into the body of Christ. But isn't that a part of the message of Paul? And Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize. Paul was not, he did, but that was because he was still living among people who were kingdom believers, who were unbelieving Jews, and he was to have a ministry with them. So therefore, he did some things early on in his ministry, in the early part of Acts, that, that fell off and are not involved in any way after, especially after he wrote his prison epistles. Now, I do not believe that anybody was placed into the nation of Israel, added to the kingdom church after Paul got saved. Even, even though they were saved under Peter or what have you, they were placed in the body church. And we'll show all of that. It's, it's clear to me. Now, the place we've got to start then is with circumcision. In verse number seven of Galatians 2, it says, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. All right, that's where we get the phrases, the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision. Well, just how important is this business of circumcision anyway? 
After all, you know, comedians make fun of the Jews as they uh, circumcise their babies in a religious ritual and so forth. Uh, obviously, it's not important. Or we have people always say, you know, the reformers, well, circumcision never saved anybody anyway, so we're all saved by faith. Yes, that's absolutely true. But do you mean to tell me that circumcision was not important? I want to tell you that there's 2,915 years of human history in which a person could not be saved unless he was circumcised. Now, you have to understand household salvation as well for you ladies and differentiating the, the sex and the like. But circumcision did not save, but you could not be saved apart from it. That's how important it was. And we're going to see in just a little bit, lest anybody say, well, it's, it's not essential. We're going to see that Jesus Christ submitted to baptism. And you know what he told John when John said, well, hey, uh, I should be baptized of you. And Jesus Christ says, thus it becomes us to fulfill all what? Righteousness. I have to be baptized because it's a righteous act under law. Guess what Jesus Christ had performed on him when he was eight days old? Circumcision. You don't think it's important? Uh, Gentiles today want to follow the Lord and go back to uh, the Gospels and, and have that type of uh, thing performed uh, in the churches today? Well, I just, I would really like to have that done. You know, what we have today is the Reformers. We've got the, the Anglicans, the Episcopalians, and, and the Presbyterians, and the Reformed theologians. And they've got this little baptism font where they bring this cute little baby and they say, baptism has replaced circumcision. We want to follow the Lord, but we're going to put this little water over his head. And he is a child of the covenant now. You want to be scripturally correct, bring that little male child forth on eight days old and circumcise him in church like they did back there with, uh, with the Jews. I bet you wouldn't have many of those rich little old ladies staying in that, that sweet church uh, with all of the religious rituals round about. As soon as the kids screamed, that would be all they could take. But that's what you had to do. And, and yet, they want to corrupt the scriptures and so forth. I'm telling you that for close to 3,000 years, circumcision did not save. But you couldn't be saved without it. Now you say, Pastor, how do you figure that? Well, let's look at the dispensation of promise. It started when Abraham was 75 years of age. But his name wasn't Abraham then, it was Abram. And he wasn't a Jew then, he was a Gentile. And you know what he was? He was uncircumcised for 24 years of the dispensation of promise. And for uh, the, um, the, the uh, earlier 75 years in the dispensation of human government. Because Abraham was born under human government, lived 75 years, entered the land under the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12. And then 24 years after God gave him the Abrahamic covenant, he said, look, I'm going to do one more thing. You're going to have to be circumcised. And at age 99, Abram became Abraham, went from being a Gentile to being the first Jew. So for 406 years, the rest of the dispensation of promise, guess what you had to do to be saved as a male? You had, and we'll see all of this, you had to be circumcised. All right, the dispensation of law, and I've added this to the point of Paul, because once Paul got saved, Paul was not saved because he was a circumcised Jew. He was saved despite that, for God had concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. He was saved despite his circumcision. We'll see how that can happen here in just a little bit. We'll see verses that say that during the kingdom, there isn't going to be anybody there with regard to a man and then the association with the families, the females, who can come to, to the Lord and be part of the kingdom without circumcision. It's over close to 3,000 years. Now, that message was ultimately, historically, given to Peter. He had the message of the circumcision. When uh, Jesus Christ gave Peter the keys to the kingdom, uh, he transferred over to him all of the powers, all of the duties, all the responsibilities of being a kingdom apostle. But a kingdom apostle means you minister to what group of people? The circumcision. Jews who had to have this ritual performed on them. You couldn't enter the kingdom without first of all being circumcised. That's it. That's it. Uh, that was the law. And then you couldn't get saved without having that mark. 
However, on the other hand, we have close to 4,085 years where there was absolutely no circumcision involved, where a person could be saved without any external marks on them. And uh, you didn't have to circumcise uh, your babies and the like. And that's the dispensation in which we live. Now, somebody's going to say, well, yes, Pastor, but in America, uh, just before the mom takes the male child home, don't they circumcise the baby? Yes, but that's for purposes of hygiene. Has the, the, there's probably a lot of Jewish doctors that perform the ceremony. I don't know. But it has nothing whatsoever to do with making the kid a child of the covenant. I mean, the, uh, the rabbi is not doing it. They're not saying all of the words, uh, repeating the words of the law and so forth. Uh, but anyway, for 4,000 years, it's not required. Now, what is the import for us now? The import for us now is you are living in a dispensation of grace where the works of the Mosaic law are not required. And the first work to go when Jesus Christ said to Paul, I send to the Gentiles was circumcision. Because it, you say, well, didn't, didn't Christ send um, didn't Christ send the apostles under the Great Commission to all nations? And I would say yes. But what did he say? Teaching the, to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Did Jesus Christ tell them to observe the Mosaic Law? Absolutely. He incorporated baptism. Circumcision is required in the Great Commission. Because the Great Commission was reiterated clear back in the Abrahamic Covenant after Abraham was circumcised. And God told Abraham, in you shall all nations of the world be blessed. The Great Commission not only includes baptism, it includes circumcision. Because you can't get the blessings of Abraham. Once Abraham was circumcised, you cannot get the blessings of Abraham under the Jewish economies, promise and, and law, without having that mark on you. Importance, Paul is sent to the Gentiles. Implication, circumcision is no longer necessary. You do not need to be circumcised first. Now, all of this talk about circumcision and so forth, probably, I, I hope that uh, this is clear enough for you. There we go probably has, uh, has some of you confused. Just let me say it. There is more than one gospel in the Word of God. Here is where the confusion is. And I've been, I've been reading some books by uh, some Reformed theologians uh, that uh, have to do with uh, refutation of Catholicism and so forth. And you know what? Those birds are good in some aspects of faith alone salvation. The battle cry of the... Uh, of the Reformation, the just shall live by faith. And they'll come right back and say, but you've got to become a child of the covenant. That's reformed theology. And, but however, circumcision, baptism, uh, especially infant bap baptism, has replaced circumcision. Well, uh, now isn't that sweet? Where in the scriptures do you find that? Sola scriptura, the reformers say, and then the reformers come right back and say, uh, baptism, infant baptism has replaced circumcision. And I say, where is that in the Bible? Would you please, would you please just show me one, would you please show me one verse that even implies that we're supposed to do that? And of course, there is none because they do not understand dispensational truths. There is a departure back to Reformed theology, Catholic theology, and away from dispensational theology today. So therefore, they say all Gospels are one Gospel. Well, how do you do that when you have the Gospel of God? Who does that go to? The Gospel of peace, the Gospel of Christ. Who does the glorious Gospel of Christ go to? What about the glorious Gospel of the blessed God? I mean, uh, come on, don't we have to define these terms? Don't we have to understand how they apply? Over here, we've got the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. We have the gospel of the circumcision. Now, if those gospels are for us, shouldn't we be doing what the Jews did under law? Absolutely we should. When did it stop historically living this side of the of the prohibition? It stopped when Paul was sent to the Gentiles when he was converted, called and commissioned on the road to Damascus. He was given at that point the gospel of the grace of God going to the Gentiles or 
to the uncircumcision. Circumcision meant that the Jews had a claim on salvation. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, who was half Gentile and half Jew, salvation is of the what? Jews. Paul said to the Jews in Rome, after he had already said two times, you've judged yourselves worthy of everlasting life, lo, I turn to the Gentiles, lo, I turn to the Gentiles, and he told the Jews at that point, strike three, be it known unto you, therefore, that the salvation of God, that Jesus said is of the Jews, that the salvation of God is now sent to the Gentiles, and they shall hear it. Actually, it was being sent to the Gentiles long before with his original commission. But you have to understand we're in a transition period. So the gospel of circumcision meant that if a man had that mark on him, he had a claim to the blessing of Abraham. However, if he didn't have that mark, he had to get the mark first before he could get saved. Under the terms of grace, guess what? You don't have to have any marks. You don't have to cut your flesh. You don't even have to have a tattoo. You can simply get it by believing on Jesus Christ. There's more than one gospel. Now, the second thing we have to understand, therefore, is that these gospels are related to two different groups of people and two apostles. Christ and the Twelve. Yes, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. He was king of the Jews. Therefore, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. That takes us back to David. The Davidic covenant says that I'm going to put a man on the throne of Israel, of the seed of David, and he's going to rule the world forever. Guess who that was? Jesus Christ. Guess who preached that after Christ ascended into the third heaven? Peter, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution. Then God, repent, and God will send Christ back. Who did he, was he talking to? Ye men of Israel, he said. Okay, that's the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of circumcision takes you back with the Jews, back to when Abraham was circumcised and God said, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And so on the eighth day of his life, guess what happened to Isaac? He was circumcised. On the eighth day of his life, guess what happened to Jacob? He was circumcised. On the eighth day of their lives, guess what happened to the 12 sons of Jacob? They were circumcised. And uh, so on and so on uh, until circumcision is no longer required. Now, they might perform the rite and ritual in this dispensation. However, it, it is meaningless. But as soon as God sent Paul to the Gentiles, it meant that we go back to somebody who was a Gentile and uncircumcised who was saved by grace through faith. His name was Abram, all right? And uh, we teach today the gospel of the uncircumcision. We are not connected to the Abrahamic covenant except by grace. We have no mark that claims it. We have no claim outside of the fact that God said, if you believe in Christ, the blessing of Abraham, that is eternal life, salvation will be yours on the basis of grace without any marking, racial um, a claim or a, a, a token claim of this. All right, now one more thing that we want to see as we're doing this. All right. Here, and I hope, uh, hope that's fairly clear on the screen overhead, but for all of the years prior to where I have the mark, guess what? Men were saved without circumcision. How was Adam saved? In uncircumcision. What about Enoch, the faithful one that was called into the presence of God? He was uncircumcised. What about Noah? We, we all like Noah and his animals. Well, guess how he was saved? Without circumcision. On and on. What about Seth? We, we talked about Seth and the Melchizedekian priesthood. Guess what? Seth was never circumcised. 
until we get to this point. And for 99 years of his life, there was a man by the name of Abraham who received blessings from God apart from what right? Circumcision. Now, from this point all the way to the point of the salvation of Saul of Tarsus, we have people who do not get salvation unless they have that mark. Now, uh, we've, we've gone to great lengths to show you the importance of, of circumcision, but there's more. This is going to probably take us uh, quite a few hours to, to wade through all of the material to place it in its proper perspective. Now, from this point onward, and we're living about right here, guess what you don't have to have in order to be saved? circumcision. How do we know that? Because Jesus Christ called another apostle apart from the twelve and their message. He called Paul. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and his message does not include baptism, the laws of, uh, of Moses, the feast of Jehovah, and it does not include, it never did right from the start, it never included circumcision. So, um, as soon as we're raptured out, it goes back to the kingdom program, and for a thousand years, people are not going to receive the blessings of the Lord, and we'll see that eventually, uh, unless they are circumcised or associated with somebody who, who is. That's household salvation, so that um, the ladies who are unclaimed blessings and living in the house of their father uh, are, are potentially safe and saved under household salvation, and then uh, the ladies who are claimed blessings and uh, under the house of their husband, uh, they get the blessings of Abraham through his uh, circumcision.